Today, we're going on an adventure. We're heading abroad to a country rich in history, natural beauty, and fascinating architecture. Welcome to Portugal. Subscribe to American Explorer. Portugal's history is defined by exploration and conquest, beautiful architecture, and destructive earthquakes. The country's location on the edge of the Iberian Peninsula led to a culture influenced heavily by maritime and sea exploration. Its civilization molded and influenced by different cultures. In a country so chock full of history and things to do, there's no better place to start than the capital city of Lisbon. Lisbon is split into several districts and neighborhoods, but in this video we're just going to stick to a few of the main areas. Bairro Alto, a rolling bohemian neighborhood known for its nightlife. The Chiado District, offering upscale shopping and beautiful streets to wander. The Baixa District, which is the heart of downtown Lisbon. And Alfama, one of the oldest neighborhoods consisting of a maze of narrow streets winding up a hill crowned by a castle. Before we get too far into it, I think it's important to just get a rough idea of the history of Lisbon, even if it's just an abridged version. Lisbon is one of the oldest cities in the world, and the second oldest capital in all of Europe behind Athens. Although the area was likely inhabited well into prehistoric times, we don't really have solid proof of city building until the Romans took control around 205 BCE until 409 CE. Ownership passed among a few different peoples, including the Visigoths, until the Moors out of North Africa overran the Iberian Peninsula in the 8th century. The city remained under Moorish rule for 433 years, until the Portuguese were able to take it after a months-long siege in 1147. There were many battles and wars fought, but we'll kind of skip ahead to the Age of Discovery, when the Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama led a fleet to India, finally breaking the Venetian rule on oriental trading. This led to Portuguese domination and wealth as they became strong explorers and traders. Jumping ahead in time, we come to undoubtedly the most important date in Lisbon history, November 1st, 1755. It was early morning on All Saints Day and many of Lisbon's citizens were inside churches worshiping when the ground began to shake and all the church bells began to ring in unison. It was a powerful earthquake that had been triggered just off the coast. What followed was one of the worst natural disasters in recorded history. The seismic waves collapsed churches, killing thousands of parishioners and buried entire neighborhoods in rubble. Much of the city was completely destroyed. While the Lisbon citizens dealt with the immediate aftershock of the catastrophe, some noticed that the water had completely withdrawn from the bay, leaving a bare wasteland. It was a drawback of an impending tidal wave that would arrive within the hour and cause even more chaos and death to the already devastated city. It's estimated that 60,000 Lisboners died that day, although no one knows the exact figures. This day became a defining moment for Portugal. As you'll see, this earthquake left its mark all over the city in big ways and small. The rebuilding that would have to come and the innovations it would inspire the writing and art of this event would become known the world over. After seeing many of its iconic buildings destroyed and its people decimated, Lisbon would need to have an astounding rebirth. Lisbon today is a vibrant city and a great destination for vacationers. Its unique architecture and hilly landscape make for beautiful scenes, and as you walk around the city, you'll begin to notice little details that make Lisbon a really special place. One of the standout architecture styles of Lisbon are the azulejos. 
These elaborately painted tiles are found all around the city, decorating the walls. The word itself is derived from an Arabic word, azulej, which roughly translates to polished stone. These tiles originally had the function of insulation and protection from the elements in Mediterranean climates, but became a form of art and expression. Although the first tiles were imported from Spain, they kept their Arabic and Muslim inspiration in the beginning. In accordance with Islamic law, they could not depict human figures, so early azulejos were decorated with complex repeating geometric designs, but slowly painters began working human forms into the art. And as Christianity came to the region, the tiles began depicting religious scenes. One interesting side bit is the prevalence of the colors blue and white, which is by no means the only color scheme, it is quite present. This is due to the fascination Portugal had with the Far East during the Age of Discovery, mimicking the color scheme of fine Chinese porcelain was seen as a way to show off your status. But as you can see through this montage, Portuguese artists certainly didn't limit themselves by color or design. Azulejos, just one little detail that makes Lisbon a uniquely beautiful city. Another beautiful architecture characteristic of Lisbon is the Portuguese pavement. Known in Portuguese as Calçada Portuguesa, it can be found all over Portugal as well as former Portuguese colonies, but is uniquely distinct in Lisbon. These mosaics are used throughout the city as sidewalks, atriums, and town squares. The designs can be as simple as repeating patterns to full-blown murals. Now let's check out some of the specific districts and what they have to offer. Up first, we have the Baixa district, often referred to as the heart of Lisbon's downtown. After the earthquake of 1755, this region was left utterly destroyed. Its rebuild was designed by Marquis de Pombal. Using one of the first grid systems for its roads, the rebuild also featured one of the first examples of earthquake-resistant construction. The key of this build was what's called a pombaline cage, where a wood lattice framework is used in conjunction with the standard masonry to distribute the force of an earthquake. The new construction was tested by having troops march around to simulate an earthquake. Another clever element of the anti-seismic design was done underground. Wooden poles were driven vertically into the riverbed to reinforce the city. Baixa today has a fascinating fusion of history, traditional Portuguese culture, generally a must-go for any Lisbon tourist. If you were to visit Lisbon in the past, there's a good chance you would have entered the city through the Praça do Comercio, or Commerce Plaza. In the center of the plaza stands a statue dedicated to King Joseph I. The plaza was part of the downtown rebuild after the earthquake, and much of Portugal's wealth was channeled through this plaza and port. It served as a hub of transportation as well as commercial business. Captains and merchants planned many of Portugal's sea voyages in the buildings around the square. From the 19th century onwards, the plaza became the seat of many government departments. In 1908, the square was the scene of the assassination of Portuguese King Carlos I. While on his way back home to his palace, his carriage passed through the plaza when shots were fired from the crowd. The king died immediately. Leading out of the plaza stands the symbolic entrance into Baixa and Lisbon as a whole. The Arca de Rua Augusta, or Rua Augusta Arch. It stands triumphantly leading you up from the Tigus River, across the Praça do Comercio, and up into the heart of Lisbon. Its construction began right after the 1755 earthquake, signifying the city's resolve to rebuild, but it wasn't completed until 1873, well after the rest of the square. While walking through the Baixa neighborhood of Lisbon, you may glance up an alleyway and double take at what you see. A wrought iron goth elevator reaching seven stories up from the streets. This is the Elevator de Santa Justa. It was built in 1902 by Raoul Mesnier du Ponsard who was a student of Gustav Eiffel. You may be able to see the similarities between this structure and Gustav's Eiffel Tower. It was originally built as an easy way to ascend from the low streets of Baisha up to the higher elevations above. From the top of the lift, you're treated to a panorama view of the city, as well as a close-up of the Carmo Convent ruins, 
yet another reminder of the earthquake of 1755. The Santa Justa lift is just one of those odd structures in a city that did not fit with the city aesthetic, but through time has become an important landmark and part of its history. At the northern side of the Baixa district is the Hosio, also known as the King Pedro IV Square. King Pedro is featured atop a column in the center of the square, and at the northern side sits the Queen Maria II National Theater. The Hosio has been one of Lisbon's main squares since the Middle Ages, and has seen revolts and celebrations, bullfights and executions, but is now a beautiful square for tourists and locals alike to meet and experience the city. Just a short stroll from the Hosio is the Church of St. Dominic. Dating back to 1241, the church is scarred yet still standing from a number of disasters. It survived an earthquake in 1531, was heavily damaged but still standing through the earthquake of 1755, and more recently a fire in 1959 that damaged much of the church's interior. It was decided during the reconstruction to leave much of this damage visible as a testament to the church's history. You can still see portions dating back to its original construction mixed with the various reconstructions throughout the years. Situated on your way between Baixa and Bairro neighborhoods is the Chiado district. This area is home to high-end shopping, boutiques, and restaurants. There you'll have a chance to stop at Livraria Bertrand, the oldest operating bookstore in the world. It was founded by two French brothers all the way back in 1732. That means it's been operating since well before the United States was even a country. Walking around Lisbon can be a tiresome affair, so when the blood sugar drops and the sweet tooth hits, you can't go wrong with the famed Lisbon Pastel de Nata. This is one of the foods Lisbon is known for. It's an egg custard tart pastry that balances the richness of the custard with a perfectly flaky crust. And depending who you ask, you'll get a different answer for the best Pastel de Nata in Lisbon. My suggestion? Try a bunch. In the hills above downtown are the steep cobblestone streets of the Barros Alto neighborhood. If the hike up looks too intense for you, you can always take one of the trams. But the view from the top of the hill is worth it. The beautiful streets of the Bairro Alto date back to the 1500s. Although now this bohemian district is known mostly for its vibrant nightlife and diverse crowds that fill its bars. The oldest and perhaps most remarkable neighborhood in Lisbon is Alfama. Due to its location on a dense bedrock, it remained nearly untouched in the 1755 earthquake. Its maze of cobblestone streets wind up the hill from the river to the crown of São Jorge Castle. Within Alfama, you'll find many of Lisbon's most iconic buildings, like the Lisbon Cathedral, the National Pantheon, and the remains of a Roman amphitheater. This area was settled by the Romans, this amphitheater itself dating back to 10 BC, and the Visigoths after them. But it was the Moors that really gave this district its unique character. Even the name is Moorish, referring to the natural springs found in the area, which is one of the reasons this place was first settled. The maze of streets is also Moorish in design, acting as a defense against invasion as well as a cooling system. The narrow roads limit the time the harsh sun can reach deep into the neighborhood. This was definitely my favorite district in Lisbon, and I spent much of my time here getting lost in the streets and taking in the views. While walking along the Lisbon shoreline, you might get a sneaking suspicion you've somehow teleported to San Francisco. But no, this is not the Golden Gate Bridge, but the Tagus River Bridge, officially called the 25 de Abril or 25 of April Bridge. The similarities aren't just in looks either. Both bridges were actually built by the same company and used much of the same steel. The similarities also likely stem from the fact that both bridges were built in highly active earthquake regions, and so they rely on similar techniques to protect from seismic activity. Its span of 7,470 feet make it the longest suspension bridge in Europe and one of the most iconic landmarks in Lisbon. 
If you continue walking down the shoreline from the bridge, you'll find the most iconic landmark in Lisbon, and perhaps even all of Portugal, the Belém Tower. Completed in 1519, it was originally designed to bolster the defense system of the mouth of the River Tagus. The prominent architecture style is Portuguese manueline, as well as hints of other design elements. Originally, there had been a permanent ship posted in the bay for defense, but King Manuel I figured it would make more financial sense to build a permanent tower. In the past, there was another tower across the river to create a crossfire for any would-be invaders. When construction was done, the tower used to be located much farther from the shore, but thanks in part to the massive earthquake of 1755, it shifted, and it's now right on the shore, well, depending on the tide. It stands as a monument to Portugal's age of discovery, and throughout its history, it served as a point of embarkation and return for Portuguese explorers, as well as a sort of ceremonial gateway into the city of Lisbon. Just up river from the Bellum Tower, you'll find the Monument to the Discoveries. This 170-foot-tall monument was built in 1960 to commemorate the 500th year anniversary of the death of Henry the Navigator. Although he's not an explorer himself, he is commemorated due to his influence in the Portuguese Age of Discovery, supporting voyages of exploration, and the funding of a school for navigators in the 15th century. Depicted along with Henry are other famous Portuguese explorers, including da Gama, Cabral, and Magellan, to name a few. This monument stands as yet another testament to the importance of exploration in Portugal's history. Well, that's all we have for this one. Our time in Lisbon has come to an end. And we barely scratched the surface of everything Lisbon has to offer, and could fill novels with the history we didn't cover. Portugal is one of the most beautiful countries I've ever had the pleasure of visiting, and has some of the most welcoming people. If you have the travel bug and haven't been, put Portugal on your list. Well, we'll see you in the next one. Obrigado. Subscribe to American Explorer. <laughs>